Welcome to the What I Meant to Say podcast. I'm your host, Wendy Jones, founder of Be Better Media and a mom of four, passionate about human connection. Some of these stories contain sensitive content about real life events and all of the information in this podcast and from anywhere on the Be Better Media website is for informational purposes only. If you find that you need help, which we all do from time to time, please reach out to a licensed professional for help. In this episode of What I Meant to Say, I sat down with brilliant writer and better human Keely Brooks to talk about her new book, I'll Never See It. This episode includes some very personal, sensitive, and even graphic stories from Keely's life, but also the resilience that shines through as she has been able to turn her wounds into wisdom. Hi, I'm Keely Brooks, and I was so happy to be on What I Meant to Say podcast with Wendy Jones. Um, Although the topic of conversation is heavy, I just want everyone to know that the reason that I was able to come on and talk about this so openly is because I wrote about it in this book and writing is extremely healing for me. It's organically healing. It's who I am. Um, But also because I've had the time to address the trauma and assess its effects on me. Um, as well as resolve a lot of the trauma. And in doing that, I was able to sort of bury who I was, um, put who I was to bed. Um, Essentially, I I felt like I lived my entire life as an 11-year-old child. Uh, So when I did get to the place of my healing, it was extremely easy to, and cathartic, to put that child to rest, to console her, to, I I don't want to say like, you know, bury her in the sense of whatever, but um, I'm far removed from who that person was and in going so deep into my healing, um, I've become another person. Uh, My life has changed completely. Who I am has changed completely. Um, And that has allowed me to move so far away from any of this that the only thing I can do with it now is bring it to the masses and share it. Um, When you heal at this level, you are no longer the same person. You no longer identify with who you were and you no longer identify with how you felt or any of the trauma that happened to you. So I just wanted to let you guys know Though the content is heavy, hang in there. It's very healing. So yes, we've been waiting to have this conversation. I've got Keely Brooks and her book is coming out in October. And I'm so honored that you're here to share your story today. So thank oh, you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And I we met in, what month was that? Was that June? June. Yeah. Yeah. We to meet up in uh, just outside Nashville when we were back there visiting and Sean Ladig, a mutual friend of ours, put us in touch. Right. And Shout out, Sean. We love you. Absolutely. <laughs> he has yeah. never connected me with a a person that I haven't been so grateful to Aww. get to know. So, um, now that I have you and then Charles, whose podcast comes out tomorrow. Um, and that beautiful conversation (laughs) we got to have, um, your husband. So out of that introduction, you know, I just got, I'm so grateful that we got to have this connection and I'm excited to hear about your new book today. I got to read some of it last night, just the first 17 pages and (laughs) they were riveting. So let's, let's dig into it and, um, let just tell me, tell me about, I mean, I'll say as a mother, the first 17 pages broke my heart and having had that conversation with you in Nashville, I know the full, I can see the evolution of the person that you've become and the relationship you have with your husband is, is so inspiring to me, but it started in a very, in those first 17 pages in a very dark place. So, you know, let's, let's start there and let me know how, when you look back on your childhood, um, for the people that haven't haven't gotten to read your book yet how would you how would you describe it um you know i had aside from this trauma stuff i had a good childhood you know um my parents were divorced and my mom raised me and my sister by herself and we were very close with 
my maternal grandparents. Um, you know, we went to a good school. Um, holidays were plentiful and abundant. Like, you know, there was there were no complaints about like home life really. Um, but when I look back on my childhood now, with the perspective that I have, I can see how right from the get go I was almost prevented from being a child and growing past a certain age, really, I think when something, you know, traumatic happens to you as a, I mean, at any age, but as a child, especially, we tend to get stuck there. And by stuck, I mean, your, your inner growth, you know, you're not developing as fast as other people, you hear things, and you understand what they mean. But when it comes to you applying them to yourself or your life, you're completely lost. You have no idea where to even start. And that's, that's, you know, a lot of what that was like for me. I got stuck at about age 11 and it started with bullying. And that just morphed into, uh, you know, an extremely low self-esteem, a lot of self-harm, depression, anxiety, panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, anorexia, um, I mean, you name it, you know, that's, that's what happens. So um, it's, it's really difficult to move on from a place like that, especially when you and no one else around you understand what's going on, why you are the way you are, why you can't just move past it, get over it. Well, there are neurological reasons for that. Yeah. You know, we tend to get stuck in places. And when we feel things, those feelings, if we don't allow them to pass through us and resolve, they get lodged in our body, whether that is, you know, not in your back and in your neck or knee issues or spinal issues or headaches or, uh, you know, gastrointestinal issues. I mean, like whatever. All of that yeah. contributes. Yeah, you know? I'm I'm such a big believer, and I feel like I came through that as an athlete and really understanding mm-hmm. how to feel my body or being in situations where maybe you're you're taught to push through and not feel mm-hmm. your body, and realizing now that that p- applies to so many other places besides athletics and what mm-hmm. it can do to our spirits when we don't have that mind body spirit alignment. And right. we're ignoring something. It really, it's, it's multifaceted, right? It's not mm-hmm. just psychology. So much of what I enjoy learning about is that our physiology and our biology become our psychology, right? Oh, yeah. How the things that we run into in life that can be no fault of our own because life is just, you know, it's happening. Mm-hmm. And the way it unfolds and how we learn to respond to it, especially when things unfold, though, as a child, you know, having the adults around us who are honestly most of the time doing the best they can with what they know. But there are ways that I think we can support children and especially highly sensitive children Mm -hmm. um, that could be more beneficial than, you know, that tough love idea of like oh you're okay like you know what they say doesn't matter or Mm -hmm. you know and I've you know reading your book I've heard myself try to articulate those things my kids you have been involved in bullying situations and not being the bully I'm huge (laughs) on teaching kindness but when a bullying situation arises and like when it happened to one of my sons it it's you know you do want to communicate like it's what you believe about yourself matters more than what they are saying, but it's really hard when that's being, when you feel it as a, as a child, that judgment is, is real. So I'm wondering if you have, you know, one, can you tell us a little bit about the bullying situation that you experienced at 11 and maybe some ways that like, as you reflect, what do you think adults can do to help children in those situations? Yeah, um, you know, one of the things that 
I think parents need to understand or should work to understand. I'm not a parent. I mean, I'm a, I'm a dog parent, but I'm not like a human parent. But I think one of the, the things that needs to be understood is just the awareness that your child does not have the capacity at that time to be able to process well, you know what, the only thing that matters is the way that I feel about myself, or it doesn't matter what they say, you know, yeah, other kids suck, and they are mean sometimes, um, we just, you know, when we're little, when we're little and so deeply affected, it, you know, to the core with something, just, just none of that applies, you don't have the wherewithal to do anything other than stay locked in that feeling, every day, every second, every minute, every hour. You dream about it, it's always there. So trying to go through life that way, and I've got a, a fantastic mother and stepfather, and they've always been very, very supportive, but no, no one has fully understood the depth to which I hurt or have been afraid or was traumatized. So I think simple communication, you know, open, honest communication without expectations is, is a great place to start because um, the, the listeners listening to the, I hate, I hate to use the word victim, but the, yeah, <laughs> the one who experienced the experience, this treatment, yes. yeah. Uh, right, right. Um, yeah, it's well, and I, I heard you say that you're not a parent, but I also, when we talked in June, heard you talk about a really special relationship you have with your nephew. And I am constantly telling my best friend who doesn't have children, but she serves an amazing role in the, in my parent, in, in my kids' lives because oh, yeah. she has this space, you know, that she just has an ability to hold space and she has wisdom that she's gained through her life and they can, they take it differently from her. And I know you have, you know, nieces or, an, or I specifically remember you talking about your nephew. And so, you know, I don't want you to take that credibility away from yourself because I think that people, you know, we come to these places for a reason and we all have something to yeah. For the next generation and I, I've heard you tell those stories so to the extent that you want to tell anybody about you know, those <laughs> like you know the experience you have or the relationship you have with your nephew um I I just I love he, how he's, we he's my heart you know next to my husband aside from my husband uh he's he is my heart he is such a sweet sweet little kid he's just all he wants to do is hug people and he tell you he loves you and he wants to help, you know, and he's so smart, but he is ADHD and he's dyslexic and dysgraphic. And so there were, you know, issues in school and issues with other kids in school. And, you know, not once did he ever turn around and just beat the shit out of another kid for what was being said, you know, um, until he had, you know, said at least three times, please stop, please leave me alone, please leave me alone. Then after that, if they came at him, he was going to put him in a headlock. I mean, yeah. come at me, bro. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, but he is, he, he still doesn't let it affect him, you know? And when I was his age, getting bullied about something, I was terrified and frozen and walked around like, I mean, my shoulders up here all the time. And he's just a happy-go-lucky, free little kid. And all I try to do is just love him and let him know, you know, you're perfect. And if you ever need to talk about anything, Kiki's here. You know, I just try to, whatever he wants to do is what we're going to do. And, you know, make sure when I go home to visit, I hang out with him and, you know, and my two nieces, they're, they're also my heart. I've got great nieces and, and nephews for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But you had asked me about, um, so the trauma. Mm -hmm. So I'll tell a little bit about this. Um, 
it was sixth grade, 11 years old. And for me, my, my world was just like Nintendo games and snowballs and pets and fighting with my sister and watching TV. <laughs> you know, it, it was not consisting of anything heavy and serious. Um, I was, however, obsessed with being a cheerleader. That was that was all I wanted out of my high school career was to move up from the Pee Wee cheerleader to the JV to the varsity, you know, <laughs> big goals for high school, <laughs> but that's what I wanted to do. And so um, in sixth grade, you know, it was a small school. There were 32 people in my graduating class. So that gives you an idea of just how small it was. And the ratio of boys to girls was definitely more girls than boys. Um, and girls could tend to, to be catty, you know, and even at 11 years old. And so we were told, look, this is when tryouts are going to be. And you guys need to partner up. And these are, we're going to practice on these days, tryouts this day everything was fine I get up and go to school the next day and I'm walking down the hall and no one is really looking at me people that I normally talk to aren't talking to me there's a lot of that going on so I knew like oh my god I immediately panic. like my first instinct was to panic and go what did I do automatically assuming I did something wrong you know, um, and it eventually came out over the course of the day that two of the girls who were also trying out for cheerleader were going around telling people, and look, I know how ridiculous it sounds <laughs> talking about this stuff as an adult over cheerleading, but when you're 11 years old and that's your world, it's super important, you know, it matters. Yeah. Um, but I'm well aware, I'm far removed from it now. And I have fun talking about it because I can sometimes hear how silly, not the bullying, but how silly it sounds um, to have let something so just ridiculous affect me, you know, and yeah. stay with me. But I always, I, that's something that always comes through to me in parenting and, and experiencing relationships with the younger generation is I always remind myself they only have the perspective of the years that they have lived. They don't right. have all of the, you know, the ways that you've come through and we'll get to that and the tools that you've developed and the relationships you've developed to, to overcome these struggles. But when you're 11, you don't have that. So no. it's everything up to that date. And then of course, you know, whatever the, mentors and parents and coaches and people in your lives, teachers that can help you process this information, but they still, it's still your 11 year old perspective. And that is, right. you know, it's so hard because yeah, I, it is, I, it is hard. And it's, it's hard for, um, you know, the, the parent, um, and it's, it's hard for, for the experiencer. Um, yeah. So how, when you were in this, so you were, when you found yourself in this situation and then you went home and you talked to your, your mom, you know, how, okay, yeah. uh, how was that met? So these girls started a rumor and were telling everybody in junior high that I was going around telling people, nobody else is going to make cheerleader except me because I'm better than everybody else. And <laughs> And it really like caught on, like older kids were believing this bullshit. Yeah. And it was really like, no one was talking to me. And this went on for days, almost a week, no one talking to me. And I would call my mom and beg her to come get me crying, screaming, begging her to come get me. And when that first day when she came and got me and I got in the car, I remember her saying, you know, baby, what's wrong, you know, and she had held me for a minute and we didn't live far from the school so she drove on home and and I told her what happened and you know she she consoled me she did what a mother would do and consoled me um and
then told me that baby, you know, sometimes kids are just mean and kids say things just to be mean, just to hurt somebody else. And I can't explain why they do it, but you know, maybe that's how they're getting treated at home. And that's the only way they know how to treat other people. And then she would try to reinforce, you know, but that's not how we treat people. So, you know, we love you. And she tried to be as encouraging as she could. And honestly, it wouldn't have mattered who said what. The problem wasn't necessarily what happened. The problem is how it affected me. It's mm -hmm. how it sat in my body and messed with my head. And then a very short you know, she told me I had to go to school, you know, she's like, you can't just stay home forever, you have to go back to school, and so it was, please, mama, let me go to another school, please, and she wouldn't let me go to another school, so then I got mad at her, because she wouldn't let me stay home, and she wouldn't let me go to another school, so it was like, everybody at school is not talking to me, and I'm going home, and not talking to my mom, because I'm mad at her, so it was so, like, no communication anywhere, so I isolated like 100 percent and I, you know that's something I was going to say earlier is I don't think either party the parent or the experiencer understands the level of patience that's needed on both sides for each person it takes a lot of patience and communication but so after you know after we got through all that nonsense um that was in August August or September of 1989. 89 is what it said in your book. Yep. 89. I was, I was doing the math because I was a freshman in high school in 1989. And nice. So you're just a few, but I, I was doing the math because some of the, like the, the things you were talking about, I was like, yeah, yeah, I remember. I remember those nice. jeans. I remember those t-shirts, <laughs> the, the Nintendo references, all of those things. I was like, yeah, I we're not too far apart. So my, my Z, yeah, my Z, I, that's what I tried out for cheerleader in with Z Caparici jeans and a new kids on the block t-shirt. Oh, yep. Right on. Go Rebel. <laughs> totally. <laughs> so, so yeah, so that was like August or September of 89. And then, um, in December of that year, um, we, my mom, my sister, and I, and my stepdad at the time went up to North Louisiana to visit um, his side of the family for Christmas. And, you know, there were kids our age up there. And um, I remember we got up there and it was snowing and everybody was excited because it never snows in Louisiana. And it was like, all we wanted to do was play in the snow. And uh, we did that for a while and came inside and next next thing I remember is we were in like a playroom. It had like a piano in there, but then there were a bunch of toys and a little TV in there, you know, playroom. Um, and everybody was playing with stuff. My, my cousins and sister were off in one corner. Some other kids were off in another corner. I'm playing on the floor with um, a toy train set. And the oldest cousin in the room um, was a male and he was four years older than me, I believe three or four years older than me. Um, and so I'm just laying there playing with this train on the floor. And next thing I know, I feel him, he came in and laid by me and like put his hands across me and started playing with the train too. And then the next thing I know, like my kid jeans are pulled down to my knees and he is just straight entering me from behind and like, like it was nothing, you know, and so far an 11 year old to, I mean, I was literally like, what, what the fuck is going on right now? You know, like what, what, what is happening? And then when I realized like, oh my God, uh, you know, I just prayed that my sister wouldn't turn around because she was in the far corner. And I just, I just kept praying that she wouldn't turn around and see because she definitely wouldn't understand. And it would have, it would have scared her. It scared me. I can't imagine how much it would have scared her, you know? And then there was the embarrassment and the shame of not wanting anyone else in the room to notice. And the reason no one else did notice is because 
he had a blanket that he had. Yeah. And everybody was occupied with toys at Christmas, you know, Nintendo toys. So, and about that time, you know, uh, there was a, a knock on the door and a parent said, you know, you guys come eat. It's, it's dinner time. And all the kids like got up and rushed out of the room. And I remember laying there thinking, oh my God, thank, thank God. This, this, you know, this is over. It's going to get away from me. And then he leans in and tells me that if I say anything, that he's going to tell everybody I'm a liar and that they'll believe him because he's older than me. I'm just a kid. I make things up. So I let him leave the room and I sat there for a minute and cried. And then my sister came back in and I still had that blanket. You know, I was sitting up at this point, but I still had that blanket pulled up. She was like, mama said, come eat. And I was like, I'm coming. And thank God she turned around and ran out, you know? So I pulled my kid jeans back up and I went to the bathroom and washed my hands and wiped my face. And I remember my mom asking me, like, are, are you okay? Are you feeling okay? And I was just like, yeah, I'm fine. And I didn't say a word until, until 2020 when I started writing the book. I just, I kept it hidden for so long because I, I figured, you know, well, who was I going to tell if I got old, older, you know, nothing can be done about it at this point. Um, but then it was also not wanting to say anything because I did feel this, um, this shame and this humiliation. And I almost felt like I was tainted, you know. Um, I felt like I was marked in a way and it, it caused major issues in, with intimacy in my life. You know, it has caused major issues. You know, luckily I worked through all this shit before Chuck. <laughs> but, I was going to you know, yeah, I mean, your story in gives 20s, me 30, you know, it was like from 1989 to 2020, you're carrying the secret mm -hmm. on your own. Mm -hmm. And the different ways when you talk about all the things you've gone through from anorexia to suicide attempts to, and this is all in your, you know, the introduction and in your bio and mm -hmm. the things that you have been through to be able to sit in that booth in Nashville and see the relationship that you have with your husband and read mm -hmm. introduction that all you ever wanted to do was find your person and be a writer. And that story that you just told to get to this interview today, to see that dream being the reality of your life, there is so <laughs> much in between 1989 and 2020 that I, I cannot even begin to process. <laughs> I know. So in 2020, like, who was the first person that that you talked to about this? And how did you get to that moment of being able to, to say it out loud after carrying it for so long? Um, well, when I wrote the book, I, I didn't know what I was gonna write. I was asked to write a story to contribute to a women's support book. And what I wrote was like 10,000 words and the publisher was like, hey, this is a little long. <laughs> for this book, but keep working on this because we're gonna make this into a book. And so I just sat down and kept writing from there. And that, that's, what, that's what came out. That's, you know, I meditated, I went into a certain place and I just started writing. And that's the part of my life story that came out. There are other parts that still haven't come out, um, but, so I guess my, my publisher was the first one to read about it. Um, and, you know, I take that back. Chuck knew. Chuck has known. Chuck has known since 2013. Yeah. So he was the only person that I told. And then. It wasn't until 2020 that I brought it up again and the publisher read it. And once she read it, 
been what I did because I didn't know how to go to my mother and say, hey, look, you know, this man that you married, his nephew did this to me right when y'all were in the other room and then told me. I brought it on myself, you know, it was my fault. Like she would be horrified and she would feel like she didn't do enough or she would somehow feel like she failed at doing something. So I didn't want to cause her any of those feelings. So I just felt it was better to stay quiet. And then when the publisher read the book, what I did um, was print it out and go up to my mom and say, hey, do you want to read my book? And I think she thought it was going to be about um, a different part of my life, some other things that happened. And when she read, she hasn't read the whole book yet, but when she read what I gave her to read, I think she was astounded. I think she was taken aback. She didn't really know what to say. You know, she cried and she did say, why didn't, you know, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you let me know? And you know, I'm so sorry, and um, so it was, it was this beautiful moment of, like, whew, okay, like, that's out, <laughs> like, I don't have to have that weight carrying me down anymore, because that's out, um, and then after she read it, she let my stepfather read it, and then my stepsister read it, um, and the, the only one who hasn't read it, um, what everybody else has read is my biological sister. So I don't think she has any clue whatsoever about any of this. I think she's going to be shocked. And I think everybody else is going to be, everybody that knows me is going to be completely, completely shocked. I expect to hear a lot of, I had no idea. Like, I know you had no idea because <laughs> I am a pro at Yep. Keeping it quiet. So when you go back to that and realizing that you're a pro at keeping it quiet, but you look back on the things that you've been through and the things you were carrying, can you share with people what keeping that story locked inside of you, the, the, the path that it let you, led you down? Oh, man. Um, anxiety crept in like in the blink of an eye immediately and it was this nagging twisting turning raw feeling burning right here at, at the solar plexus and then that was accompanied by you know my abdomen was just in knots <clears throat> excuse me my abdomen was in knots shoulders were up here I'm not even taking full breaths because I'm breathing with my lungs not the diaphragm my posture, everything was affected. Then depression came. And this was all sixth grade into seventh grade. Um, depression came, OCD came, and that, I'm sure that's been super fun. Chuck's so great because he's just like, eh, just let her do whatever, you know. Do you need me to bring these groceries in? He just brings them in and sets them down because he knows if he goes and puts them up, I'm just going to go back and rearrange everything. So he just lets me do it. <laughs> But he also understands I'm not, I'm not this way um, to try to be annoying. I do these things because they're what help me feel regulated. That's what I need to feel safe and balanced and clean in my environment. You know, that's what I need for my life to feel good in my life. So I don't expect that out of him or other people, but he's really awesome and just letting me be who I am and loving me for who I am and supporting me through that um what an amazing place to get to after this story and that's I think one of the things I keep coming back to your relationship because I'm just <laughs> in awe of I'm I, knowing how people can go through such terribly traumatic and terrible things but come together and connect from a place of strength because there are so many trauma bonds out there right when we're yeah. feeling unworthy and these types of situations and I'm not sure that I've seen anything in my experience that's worse than sexual trauma and sexual assault especially mm -hmm. 
on a, I mean, I shouldn't even say, especially on a child, but with an innocent child that just the path is so devastating to heal from, mm -hmm. from anybody I've ever been. And the, the numbers out there on the statistics on sexual assault are terrifying as a woman right. and as a mother, it, it's, it's just, it's terrible, but to see somebody and see you guys come together from this place of strength and to hear you say like, he accepts, accept, accepts me for who I am is, I mean, it just gives me so much hope for the world because that <laughs> if people were connecting like that, you know, whether in marital relationships or as friends or just as people right. they are crossing each other's paths, the world is such a different place from that vantage point, you know? Why are we not? I mean, that's what we need to be doing is getting to know people, different cultures, different races, all communicate and be kind, you know, be positive, be kind, be supportive. If you see somebody in need, help them. You, you know, um, I, there's so much hate and like segregation going on and, and it's, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. It really is you know, and it just makes something like bullying even, even worse, much worse, you know, and, and especially, you know, when you're a kid, it doesn't just manifest with, um, you know, mental health issues, um, behavioral things start to happen as well, you know, um, anorexia, yeah. you know, I, I, I was down to, I think at one point my lowest weight was 89 pounds at five six and a half oh my god and it was just like I purposely wasn't eating but not because I thought I was fat I was not eating because I was so frozen in trauma and every time I ate it just went right through me so my nerves were in a sense preventing me from eating so I just would nibble on a little bit you know as I could um, but then once I got into college, carrying all of that, uh, the depression got super, super, super bad, super bad. And the self-harm, self-harm started to develop. Um, it had started to develop a little bit at home, but just one or two times at home, I had gotten, I think it was mad at myself about something. And, you know, I had to, I didn't cut, I didn't punch walls or anything like that, but I did fist up and take it out on myself, you know, the abdomen, the legs, the head. Um, and that, that carried over into college and it got really intense in college and it even morphed into suicide, suicidal thoughts, like. I'm tired of this. Like I wasn't getting up and going to class. Shades were drawn all the time. The only thing I would watch was like Mama's Family on TV because I love, I love Mama, and <laughs> it was one of my favorite shows, and it made me feel good. So I would watch Mama's Family, and if I wasn't doing that, I was laying in the spare bedroom in the dark, crying next to a knife. I had a, a big kitchen knife that I had with me at all times and just just to be there just in case you know that my curiosity was peaked it was there it was you know I'm not gonna live the rest of my life feeling this way like this you kidding me this hurts I'd rather have my face burnt off than have to like deal with this stuff because now now you're developing aches and pains that people are saying are non-existent or that you're just making them up but when you're not eating and you're holding so much stress and trauma, no doctor, these aren't mystery aches and pains, pay attention, it, you know, and yeah. it, it, it's like mental health issues, trauma, mental health issues get so overlooked, just disregarded, you know, hysterics. I've heard that. And it just, it really sucks. So when all the self-harm was going on, I lied through my teeth. I was, I was going to college in Hammond, Louisiana, at Southeastern Louisiana State University. And um, so it was about 45 minutes from my home. And every time my mom would call, yep, doing great. 
makeup stuff I was doing in class. I, I mean, I, I made up anything to convince her that I was doing great and I was happy and everything was fine. And then finally, one day she called when I was in the middle of a meltdown and that, that was it. And she was like, okay, okay, why don't you come home? Let's, let's get you some help. And um, during that time, I was, I was with my high school uh, sweetheart at the time. He and I went to Southeastern together and ended up breaking up. And that, um, that had some, some physical stuff to it. Um, you know, just one of us trying to prevent the other from leaving or doing something and getting tripped up. And, you know, I fell downstairs once and uh, we were arguing a another time and he backed into me with his truck. And mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was, it, and like, we're, we're friends today, you know, like that. Um, it was, it was a really hard time for both of us then. Um, yeah, those but, are the, yeah, that's, that's that difference between trauma bonds and clinging to each other out of a sense of like, yeah. I can't do and this. That's what I was life. doing was clinging. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, at while all this is going on, I can't believe I almost left this out. So my, um, my biological father uh, is not in my life. And he will swear on the Bible that it's at my choice, but it's not at all. I've tried for almost 15 years. And he never, never, he threatens me with a restraining order. But when I was graduating high school, he was getting married to um, this woman, and we found out that he was moving to Kentucky, uh, like, in a couple days, and I'm thinking, like, what? My dad's moving? How? Called him up, like, How are you moving? Or were you going to tell us, you know, and he was like, what what I do in my life is none of your business. If I want you and your sister to know about it, you'll know. And I was like, oh my God. And that that how, crushed me right there. How often was, how often had you been seeing him up to that point? Like what was your relationship like when you found that out? I was a total daddy's girl. I'm I'm the oldest. I mean, we I, we have pictures of him like just throwing me up in the air. Like I love my daddy total daddy's girl and even when he and my mother divorced they remained on good terms and we saw him um, every weekend you know we even took family vacations together sometimes but then come high school everything started to change and um, when the whole Kentucky thing happened I felt something I had never felt before and I still don't understand what the feeling is but it's, 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 it encompasses so much rage and devastation and desperation and panic. Mm -hmm. Like the bullying thing and the sexual assault were bad enough, but this was destroying my world. This was this is what pushed me to the knife mm. with all the stuff going on with him. And, you know, I'm, I'm a Taurus. I'm a mouthy bitch sometimes. So, and that's, that's, you mess with the bull, you get the horns. And, mm. you know, at this time, I was like 19 years old, 18, 19 years old, and the horns came out. And I left him a very nasty message on his answer machine. And told him, uh, you know, if that's all he wanted to be was a sperm donor, then so be it, you know. And then, of course, I got chewed out by him for, you know, talking talking to him disrespectfully and, like, never mind that you haven't been around to be a parent. <laughs> you right. don't get to come fuss at me. Um, so, so, yeah, there was a lot going on with him. And um, in 2001, I got married and divorced in 2005 and I had a conversation with my dad after a whole bunch of family drama um, I had a conversation with him and he said you know what Keely 
the way you are, I'd rather have you as a memory than to have you in my life at all. And that, that's exact, that is exactly how I sat there. I was like, I mean, I was sitting like I just felt the- that I just felt that knife to the gut and that's yeah. not yeah. and the chills won't go away right. so I yeah. can't imagine as the daughter processing that right and so I said the only thing I knew to say is you know well you know what dad you got your wish and I hung up the phone because what else am I supposed to do sit there and keep taking the beating no so, and then he immediately turned around and called my sister and said, oh, well, your sister's chosen not to have me in her life and, you know, tried to insert her into it. And so it's been like 15 years, almost 20 years. Yeah. And we hadn't seen him or talked to him. So all of that was going on and that just further propelled me into, into madness, really. Um, I mean, I wasn't like hallucinating, walking around, talking to walls and stuff. It, everything was internalized. I yeah. put on a good show. I mean, I could put on makeup and fake it and get out there and cheer and be friends with everybody because nobody, nobody could see what was going on inside. Nobody could feel it. Nobody could see it. So if I just put this show on and ha- have everybody believe in that things are fine then it'll keep them at bay. So that's what I did. That's why I hate the phrase, fake it till you make it. I think parents should not ever tell their child (laughs) to fake it till you make it because all that does is instill a false sense of self. And and why, why are you faking it? Why do we have to not be ourselves? Why do we have to fake it to appear one way to get something? That's so messed up. So that fake it till you make it will, will end up hurting you more in the long run than it will helping you for sure. Yeah. I totally I totally agree with you on that. That disconnection from true self, which is hard enough to find on really in any life path, right? Because there's mm-hmm. so much that we put on ourselves about what the world expects of us and what our parents expect of us. And a lot of times we can do that to ourselves without anybody ever oh, right. saying anything. Right. We don't need somebody. Yeah. But when you add trauma to that, it is a recipe and that deep sense of unworthiness that comes Mm-hmm. from I mean your path but like you know that is something that I have seen at the base of every struggle to strength story is overcoming that sense of unworthiness that something along our path convinced us of that we were not worthy of our best story and I can hear that come through your story and it like it breaks my heart and it also makes me look at the ways that I can help my own kids which I'm always looking for ways to do, but, you know, parenting is, it's such an imperfect journey. And I always say it's an art, not a science. That's right. But we have, it's like, you constantly have to forgive yourself and then figure out how to do better. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I look at your story, I'm wondering, you know, along your path, what were some of the ways that people be began to show up for you through all of the struggles that you went through or, Hmm. (laughs) or, you know, and maybe it all just came out in your writing, but. Um, Yeah. Writing, writing is where a lot of it came out. I've always written ever since I was like seven, eight years old. Um, I, I wrote my first poem in third grade and like won a contest with it. And I was like, Oh my God. (laughs) Yeah. This is the book that is out, <laughs> Poetry from an Isolated Soul, yes. um, and Tell I've spent, know. yeah, I've spent some mornings reading your poetry, and it really, you know, if you want to tell me about that creative journey that, that helps, that helps you heal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, writing was the one place that I could confess my truest feelings, my deepest, darkest thoughts feelings, desires, whatever. And from a very early age, my mind was constantly flooded with 
stuff to write about. I mean, I'd look out the window and see a tree and a poem would pop into my head and I'm like, or I'm sitting in, a, you know, an airline terminal and it's like, oh, you have to write this story right now. It, that has just always happened. And I was always too scared to do anything with my writing because it was more personal creative writing, um, not necessarily like fiction. Um, and so I kept it hidden. And even at one point, I had a boyfriend who, uh, while I was at work, read a lot of my journals and decided they weren't healthy for me to have around. So he burned all of the journals that he found. And that had a lot of my creative writing in it, a lot of short stories, a lot of poetry, a lot of prose. And so he, he burned that. And after that, I was like, okay, I started keeping everything all together, one place. Yeah, and no, be, nobody a, sees it, nobody knows about it. <laughs> it just stays uh, with me. But, um, and then there, there was even like almost, I guess there was about five or six years that I didn't write at all. I wanted to write. I had this deep, deep, deep desire, yearning to write, but I was terrified to write. What I was ages, terrified to sit down and do it. I what, was terrified. What part of your I, life did that happen? What years was that, that you were terrified to write? I mean, can you remember? Oh, this, this would have been um, 2000, 2012 to 2000. Might have even been longer than that, 2012 to about 2019. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't write for a while. I mean, I was working as an entertainment writer through some of that. And so I was like writing research papers in graduate school and writing music articles or film articles. But this type of creative writing I was not doing. Um, and then, you know, COVID hit and that's that's how the book developed and I sat down and <laughs> I really want to tell you how I did it but I don't know that I can because it's like a, a, a you know a public podcast oh, no. I I, I well know. you're you're welcome to share whatever version of <laughs> how much of the story you want to share but um, um, I do believe I, in the creative muse and the however that comes through so I mean I just had um certain things come my way the universe just sent certain um healing herbs and things my way that helped to uh relax and focus my mind and open the door for my creativity to feed out and that's that's what happened during covid was um i sat down and drank some tea and in three weeks i had you know, 60,000 words written and gave it to the publisher. And she was like, this is really good, but why don't you go back and, you know, add little, add little personal details here and there. And so I was like, oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to one up that. So what I did was I went back and included, if I'm talking about um, maybe depression or anxiety, I include um, a little like a breakout box that's going to have suggestions like a mantra. I'll tell you what a mantra is and tell you what my first one was and how it applied to this bullying situation that I just talked about. Or um, when I get around to talking about Chuck, um, there's a, a, a little anecdote that tells you how our nickname dummy yeah. came into play. And so you get like that, that little look. And then I have you know, um, excuse me, poetry that's in there. I also have different pieces of prose that I wrote in the depths of my depression and anxiety and self-harm. So um, a lot of the writing was done um, during the suicide attempts. Um, yeah. I mean, I was well, close to just go drive. Like there were so many times I'd be driving and looking at a tree and I'm like, all I'd have to do is just jerk the wheel, you know, like it'd be that easy. I don't know how I managed to make it this far. Like I've got 
angels, I was just... spirit guides, and ancestors all around me because mm. I should not be here with the amount of times I was not paying attention while I was driving, had no business driving. Um, you know, just the amount of times I, you know, tried to commit um, suicide one time. Um, so this wasn't in what I sent you and I'll leave all the, the graphic details out because you'll, you'll want to read it. Um, that may be where some Jillian Flynn pops up. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Uh, yeah. Uh -huh. So one time I tried, um, it was a nice scenario again. And I was, you know, in a heartache and in, in, in a place in a place with that feeling that I described what I felt with my father, that anger, that rage, desperation, and devastation. And so I sat there, I, I beat my, beat the shit out of myself for I don't know how long. Um, and then at one point I looked down and like there were bruises and, you know, blood on my body. And then I saw the knife and I ended up you know, in the midst of like beating the shit out of myself, I slipped and fell and land, you know, landed on the floor and that knife was right there. And so I picked that up and just, you know, put the tip of it to my finger and was just, you know, twisting it back and forth to feel that point. And it was like, just easily just slide that down. And I did, man, I slid it down and sat there playing with it. And I wanted to see how it felt. You know, I wanted to know what it felt like. And I kept digging it in and digging it in. And then I punctured skin. And I was like, okay. So I went in a little deeper. And just when I started to like go to drag, my phone rang and snapped me out of it. That didn't snap me out of, you know, continuing with any beating because it was like, you can't even do this right, Keely. <laughs> You suck at even doing this. You can't do this right, you know? And so that's a big, long, um, a good story in there. And then the other suicide attempt um, was after all this mess with, with my father. It was after the memory comment. Um, I, a total daddy's girl. I mean, even still, I do love him, but I'm not in a place today that I was with him 20 years ago, you know, I, I don't know that I would allow him in my life today. If he was willing to talk, I'd talk, but you don't, you don't, you don't get to come inside and behind the curtain. That doesn't happen. Um, so I was hurting so bad and, you know, no one seemed to understand. Um, and so I did the only thing I knew to do. I called a friend. At the time, I was an entertainment journalist. I was around musicians who were always, you know, snorting cocaine or shooting something or smoking something. And so I knew who to call to get what I needed. And so I did that and shut up in the closet and then woke up the next day and was like, what the fuck? It was like, are you... <laughs> Are you serious right now? Are you shitting me? Why can I not do this right? Like, what is going on? So many times, something was always protecting me. Always protecting me. Oh, yeah. Gosh. I, mm. The power, I, first of all, the tragedies that, that you have experienced as a human being, like my heart is literally sitting here breaking and I, I'm... I'm so grateful that you're here to tell your story because I know that the reason <laughs> you go through things that you're going to help so many people, but it's just, it's heartbreaking to feel what I, I knowing you today and seeing where you've got, gotten to the point that you've gotten to in your life. How, how does the human spirit make this turn? and get to the place where you are today because I think that's the part of the story because there are so many people out there hurting that you are that inspiration for them that you can get through the most difficult things and for people listening to this story this to me is the depth of the human experience that I have never been and to see the strength in you today that's the inspiration I want the people out there to feel like how do you get there 
Oh, thank you. Um, a lot of patience. <laughs> um, you know, what, what started to kind of change things for me um, is when I met Chuck, honestly, and it's the way, it's his perspective on life, on energy. It's just his perspective on everything, his outlook on everything really resonated with me. And it, it clicked in a way that made total sense. So and the things that he was saying to me and the way he was treating me, like he makes me feel like a little soft baby kitty all the time, you know, and it's just never like, you're getting on my nerves. Never once has he raised his voice to me or made me feel like, bitch, you got things wrong with you. You need to handle your shit. Like, no, he is always my best friend and super supportive. Um, and so that, that was, the light bulb flipping on was hey he's going to be very important I'm not sure how yet but I knew in my bones that that's step one and um, through him I fell into martial arts and started studying kung fu and loved it but at the same time I went off of my psychotropic medication. So it, anything I was taking for depression or anxiety, I was tired of all the pills, man. That's all doctors want to do is eat this, eat this, eat this. You got this side effect from that? We'll take this and this. And where does it end? And I was tired of feeling apathetic and disconnected. And so I ditched all the meds and I started studying Kung Fu. And that started teaching me about the flow of life, of energy, uh, the flow of energy through the body. I started teaching me about the human body in a way that allowed me to disconnect my body from any, um, you know, trauma, any assault, any negativity. And so I really started tuning into things and really started meditating more um and you know while we were there that was even a really hard uh, a really hard time because uh, Chuck's been studying for like two decades and we were at a studio in Baton Rouge with a very popular um Sifu and um he he was very inappropriate um, like would pull me off the floor to sit at his feet to talk about himself, um, do it all the time in the middle of cl class to where other people were starting to notice and talking about it. And then he like way crossed the line and started telling me about his se sexual interactions with students in the dojo. And then he started, he took it a step further and started pointing out where in the dojo he had sex with so-and-so. And then he started talking to me about his junk and what it looked like and what he liked. And I was like, okay, okay. And I just got up, like, I, I'm not doing this. And, um, you know, that's when Chuck and I like left at that point because that was, and it broke Chuck's heart because Chuck really trusted this man. I mean, he's, he's a brilliant martial artist but he's just been knocked in the head a, a little too much. Um, and it, it was a really hard situation. So we left there. And after that, it was hard to find any inspiration, honestly, because we couldn't even bring ourselves to practice Kung Fu because it, it was too close to the studio and the experience. So we needed uh, some distance for that. And we ended up, uh, marrying in 2016 and we moved out to be near my family um, they live like um, a little suburb of Baton Rouge and um, they're spread out on you know 20 something acres and it's my grandfather and my stepsister and her husband my blood sister and her husband and the kids and my mom and stepdad and we moved out there to be with them and we stayed out there for five years. And as much as I love my papa and my mom and my stepdad, my sister and the kids and all that, 
oh my God, I do not ever, ever, ever to anybody recommend living all around your family. I don't think that is healthy. <laughs> you will drive each other crazy. It has its good, good sides, but it has its bad sides. And for us, one of the bad sides, uh, I mean, Chuck and I are the tattooed and pierced people in the family. Everybody else is, you know, eight to five, church on Sunday, wh whatever. We're just different. And um, my mother's brother, I don't even call him my uncle. So her brother and his wife um, just had it out for me and verbally attacked me in the yard one day. And um, I had to hear all about how I have no responsibility in my life. Um, and then I was called a white trash junkie. And that was 2018. And the second that I was called a white trash junkie, that sent me right back, right back to like 1998, where I was thought, you know, bad with the self-harm. Yeah. Um, and, and it did, I, I kicked up the self-harm again and I had to hide it if this was the first time I was engaging in self-harm since I'd, I'd known Chuck we've been together for like 11 and a half years and um so I was hiding it you know when I was in the bathroom I couldn't beat on myself anywhere because it would leave bruises and he would see that and be like well, what the hell's going on but I have hair so I I just focus on my head I would just take oh. it out on my head which is like so bad right mm -hmm. but when I was again locked in that feeling stuck in that feeling stuck in that moment paralyzed of being called a white trash junkie I mean it destroyed me I started smoking cigarettes again I was not eating right I wasn't living well I mean I was very unhealthy my weight was falling and it it was it was really bad and, you know, after a year and a half, Chuck got, uh, he, he started looking at other jobs and uh, we landed up here in North Alabama, which is beautiful and amazing and we love it. But we landed up here and that's really when uh, I turned a corner. Yeah, there's something going on in the world that is so, there this parallel universe that needs to overcome this mm -hmm. lack of worth and I don't like the word victim but victimhood of how things happen to us and we don't know how to get out of them and yeah. choosing the people that we surround ourselves with and how that becomes not just the relation the relationship we have with ourselves becomes an entire society right mm -hmm. and if we're not teaching people how to get to, how to know themselves and be honest with themselves and then surround themselves with people that that can support that best version of themselves you right. know we're we're up a creek and i think oh, what yeah. you're describing there is those relationships manifested on a societal level and it's it's terrifying you know it's so very terrifying yeah it's, it's just so terrifying and you know when when all the white trash junkie comments stuff happened, it was doubly as hard because I was telling my mother and stepfather, like, hey, your brother and his bitch wife just called your daughter a white trash junkie. And like, nobody, nobody cared. All I was being told was, Keely, you have to get over it. You have to let it go. Just get over it. Like, no one seemed to think it was a big deal other than me and my husband everyone else still talks with them and engages with them and interacts with them so it was literally like I was the target of nastiness and, and it's my fault you know so it was, I can it was, yeah it's it hitting right really back to, yeah I can I can yeah. see how it's hitting that wound from right. from earlier so, that takes you right back into that sense of unworthiness and yeah 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 you just um so you guys got hopeless and and unworthy and like I'm a burden I mean 
all the negative things that you can think of. But when we moved, the day we moved out and left there, like when we hit the state line for Mississippi, I was still like a little, you know, a little tense and like gripping the wheel. And like, but once we hit Alabama, it's like things started to settle, things started to calm down. And after we, you know, it took a few months to settle in. And then I, I just had a day where I was like, I'm so tired of feeling like this. And I'm so tired of, of having this nagging feeling inside of me that's letting me know I'm not on my right path. You know, what is it I'm supposed to be doing? Who am I? All of that was eating me alive because I had faked it for so long. I didn't know who the hell I was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I liked. I couldn't make a decision to save my life. So I had enough one day and I just said, I have to change something. And I found a trauma therapist here in Florence. And she is like the universe straight sent her to me for me. She is perfect. And I love her. And she has been so helpful and instrumental in helping me address trauma and educate myself about it and be able to learn from it and move forward because of it. Um, doing that, but then I've also engaged a lot of self-care techniques. You know, I don't subscribe to this eight to five kind of world and like, no, I don't make I don't make 40 grand a year. Oh my God, what am I going to do? Like, I'm not worried about those things. I'm worried about why we're here <laughs> and what my purpose is here. And so I also started meditating a lot more. I started doing yoga a lot more. I started spending more time out in nature, walking with the trees, with my dogs. And then I started meeting people in the community who are like-minded like me. I even started seeing um, a quantum Reiki healer and I've been going through quantum Reiki sessions. Um, it, yeah, I mean, the combination of those things for sure has helped to turn the corner, but the, the main catalyst has been my writing for sure. I mean, I never thought that in writing what I did, I, I didn't, and sometimes I still worry that it won't be well received because it is such dark material, um, you know, but I hope people will find it enthralling and riveting and can walk away from, away from it feeling like they've learned something, you know, um, and I'm just, I never dreamed that it would be so healing, but once I purged all of that out and then I left. And then I started therapy and then I started meditating more. And then, and literally I've been on a tension ball and wall edges every, all the time, all the time. If I'm not walking the dog, cleaning and writing or doing yoga, I'm on a tension ball. And the amount of things that happen to our body when we're stressed or sad or panicked or assaulted, whatever is unbelievable. Not only do emotions get lodged in the body and create blockages, but our physical body tenses up. I mean, the amount of unraveling that has happened along my spine, around my shoulders, like I've probably grown an inch taller, like my hips have fallen back into place. My shoulders have opened up. I can breathe differently and deeper now. I sleep better. You know, I also, uh, diet, diet is, is super important. Um, we, we eat clean. We are a lot of fish and vegetables and we don't do any caffeine and low sugar. Um, and all, it's just, of, all of these things that you're saying, and this is where we connected. I yeah. <laughs> could not agree with you more. The, everything you've mentioned has been part of my healing path. And as hard as it is for me to hear what you've been through, to know that you've connected in all of these things and to find other people out there who believe these things and are on that path mm -hmm. and that we can spread this story together 
this is what the world needs to hear. Me, yeah. That's, and that's we're absolutely. all capable of it. Like we're all capable of it. Nobody needs to compare their stories. Nobody, no. you know, and you were saying something when we started about not being able to understand somebody, but not identify with their trauma in a way that it, we allow it into our bodies. Right. All of these things you've learned and that you're practicing, like what I hope people will see through this podcast is the incredible power we have within ourselves to heal. Right. It, it, it's all within ourselves and it takes a while to quiet the mind. It was really, really hard for me to sit down and meditate because this would not shut up. Mm -hmm. And it was so loud and so mean and so negative and so critical. And I, I had to force it. I just stuck with it every day. I kept forcing it. Then I started listening to guided meditation. And then I'd work on laying down and getting my body to relax. And if that meant laying there for 25 minutes, letting it settle and release some tension, so I could get a good meditation and that's what I was going to do. But self-care, I cannot stress the importance of self-care from how you eat to who you surround yourself with, what's in your environment. Uh, I mean, exercise, water, making sure you get your vitamins and minerals. And, you know, this has also been a huge game changer for, for me, as simple as it sounds. Um, especially, especially, especially as someone who has grown up her whole life feeling like it's never going to change. This is never, this is just who I am. You know, I, this is just mm -hmm. what it's going to be. Oh, that is, yeah. It, you know, and it was like, I look Terrible around place. and I've got all these things to be grateful for. I've got a very loving mother and stepfather. You know, I've, I've got siblings and my papa's my heart. You know, this dear man is hanging on at 96 and a half years old. <laughs> and, you know, I had all these beautiful, wonderful people and things in my life. But you couldn't tell it by looking at me because you could tell in my eyes that I was unhappy. And my mood was sad and negative. And sometimes I was ungrateful. You know, at one point, um, I had a doctor diagnose me with borderline personality disorder, which is like unstable mood, difficulty in relationships, difficulty processing information. And today that's known as complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So that really helped clarify some things for me like, oh, <laughs> That's what was going on 25 years ago is I was traumatized. That's what, that really opened my eyes. And so to come from a place of being unable to feel grateful, be grateful, express gratitude to a, a place where now I do it every day. Like I don't wake up with anxiety anymore. I'm happy to wake up. I'm grateful I have all five senses to see colors and nature and my dogs and you know I'm grateful for the amazing husband that I have and my, my creativities and talents mm -hmm. you know and the people that have crossed my path and I get to help and it's just yeah gratitude it's so, it's so amazing yeah it's just gratitude's a game changer so small right it's just something so small and it doesn't take any effort it even if you don't feel it and you don't mean it still saying just you know looking up and just saying you know what thank you for waking, waking me up today thank you I've got my five senses thank you for that you know and just move on the more you keep doing that the deeper that gets and then before you know it, it's like planted its seeds all up in your business and yeah. boom, gratitude I'm, and absolutely. not just gratitude, but gratitude and grace are sprouting. And absolutely. that's, you know, we need to extend grace to other people. Yes, but it starts with ourselves. If we can't extend it to ourselves and we are working to extend it to other people, that's just it's yeah. like being a hypocrite, you know, you're not, you're not applying it to yourself, or you're going to talk to me about applying it. To it. So I think if people extended grace to themselves a lot more, you know, 
um, people yeah. are so work oriented and I mean, it's crazy with kids these days. You've got to get here and here and this practice, yeah. this practice, this game, this event, whatever. And it's just nonstop. And there's so many mothers out there that are like, I just want five seconds to like, I just want to go pee by myself. I just, you know, I want to take a bath today. And I, it just breaks my heart. It shouldn't be like that. Like, when did we get so crazy with staying busy all the time it's like sun's up to sun down you got to be non-stop busy yeah I think that's I think that's where that meditation comes in it's it's actually and it's harder and harder in today's world to learn how to slow it down mm -hmm. but I do think you know so many of those self-care things that you were talking about and meditation in, in particular for me and yoga I had no idea how fast my mind was going until I taught it how to slow down Right. right. Yeah. And, yeah. I mean, it's, it's huge. So it's yeah, you don't realize how thing. fast it goes. Yeah. It, it, with and it's, it's hard to get and, it to slow down. Yeah. With, with yeah. everything, it's, it's hard to get it to, to slow down. And look, there are plenty of times that I'm teaching a class or doing a class and I'm doing one thing, but my brain is somewhere else, you know? Yeah. And it, I mean, that just happens, but my body knows what's going on. So well, the harder my body works, yeah, the quieter this gets. And so yep. that's why I love yoga because it's what I use to like calm me down, ground me out, you know, yeah. and I, meditation I, is my peace and relaxation. Yep. I am totally with you on both of those yeah. things. Yeah. <laughs> where we, yeah, where we meet and to see where you are today and have that first conversation the way that we sat for hours and just talked like we had known each so other forever fun. to, you know, to get all the way back to the base of your story today. I just, I thank you so much for sharing it. I'm so excited for your book to come out and help all the people Aww. that are going to, your writing is beautiful and your story thank is you. powerful. So thank you for sharing. You. And can You're you so let welcome. people, can you let people know um, where they can find you to connect? And then we'll make sure that gets in the show notes as well. Yes, sure. Um, you can find me at, um, I have a website. It's www.dkeelybrooks.com. And then um, also on Facebook at author Keely Brooks and Instagram at the Keely Brooks. Yeah. Perfect. So, and you know, the poetry book is currently out now. Um, the creative nonfiction novel that's I'll never see it will be out October. And then um, I've got other projects in the works, um, specifically one that I'm collaborating with three other fiction authors on. And then uh, Chuck and I are writing a nonfiction book together that's all about um, Louisiana, our time there, our experiences there. It's a peek uh, behind the facade of, Louis of Louisiana to expose you know, what's going on behind the scenes. This is what we dealt with, you know. And, and, and I'm sure there are plenty of places that are like that for plenty of people this is just our story you know it just sure. happens to be Louisiana and it just happens to be our story and you know it, it's a very healing therapeutic process for us and it's fun to sit down and write a book together I mean we that's awesome non-stop uh, all the time so there's definitely a lot more work coming for sure <laughs> I love it and I love it coming from the two of you because I know once people hear uh, Chuck's podcast and then your pod we're going to send people back and forth between the two because your story comes together so beautifully and you both have a such a healing perspective on on you know how people can come together in strength and I just thank you for sharing it with me and um, yeah absolutely You're most welcome thank you for having me it's it's an honor all right. Well, we will talk soon, I'm sure. And congrats on yes. the book and we'll, we'll be putting it out there for you too. I can't wait for everyone to read it. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.